appreciate it. Um, we've got a few speakers today. It's an excellent lineup. I'm very excited about it, and it's a beautiful day here in Northampton. Uh, before we get on to the main program, though, I... Yesterday we lost a member of our community uh, who is one of the first people I met when I came to Northampton, one of the first people in the trans community I met. She has been at everywhere I go, every time I'm doing activism, every time I'm speaking, she was always there if she could be. She competed in the very first Miss Trans Northampton pageant with me, and and her presence and her bravery and her strength was always an inspiration to me. She wasn't afraid to stand up and be counted as transgender. And um, Samantha Cornell passed away yesterday uh, after a fight with brain cancer. So I'd like to ask all of you, in memory of Samantha, to please <coughs> bow your heads for a moment and Join me in a moment of silence for a lost member of our community. Thank you, everyone. Please keep Sammy and her longtime partner Vicky in your memories. So to start it, start things off today, I'm going to bring up to the podium uh, a fantastic man, uh, a beautiful and man, a, a, a wonderful activist. Please put your hands together for Reverend Lewis Mitchell. <laughs> yeah. Greetings, everyone. I, I do want to say that I love the intimacy of our gathering. <laughs> uh, you laugh, but you know, interestingly enough, one of the things I've learned over the years of speaking here and there is that a big crowd is not a crowd that joins you in spirit and in heart. And in honoring Sammy's life and service to us as a community, Sammy was one of those people that showed up with her heart everywhere, all the time. Um, sometimes you never knew what she was doing, but you knew she was doing something helpful. And so in a lot of ways, I'd like to challenge us to model our lives of service to our communities after Sammy. Not for the thanks and for the accolades, but because she had a heart to serve. And I'm grateful for her, and I miss her, and I hold Vicki and their entire family in my heart and in my prayer today. I want to tell you why I'm here. I am here because I am a transsexual man. I was born a little girl a long, 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 long time ago. And I was much like my little girl, um, dressed in pink and all that jazz. And early on, I had a feeling that something wasn't quite right. And as that feeling progressed, I did what I knew how to do, which was I became a dyke, because that was the closest thing I could find that was fitting me. And through a program of recovery and discernment and self-knowledge, I realized that I could no longer hide out in women's spaces, because as a good womanist, I couldn't take up space because I was too afraid to transition. And so I began my transition, and I became the man that is standing here now. All of that is delightful and wonderful, 
And what is most present in my mind today is that when I was a little kid, I had this dream that was an impossibility. I dreamt of being a father and a husband and a man in the community that could be counted on. None of those things were possible for that little girl in 1964 and 1965. It was akin to saying, I'm gonna learn how to levitate and just stay there. And in my community, the African American community, the notion of changing gender is much like changing race. It's an impossibility, it can't be done. Not it shouldn't be done, but it can't be done. And so when I transitioned for my mother, it was much like saying, oh, mom, I've always felt white, I'm going to become white. She couldn't quite wrap her head around it, understandably. What I have come to learn is that regardless of what your spiritual or religious upbringing and underpinning and belief system is, we know who we are in our spirits before our bodies catch up. And were it not for that spiritual knowledge, most of us would have given up a long time ago. While we lost Sammy to brain cancer in Philadelphia, where I'm currently working, in the last month, we have lost at least two that we know about to violence. One, Kyra, who was an amazing activist in Philadelphia, who was brutally murdered. And another woman who had her home invaded, her mother was murdered and she was shot and is in, she is still in critical care. Why is that true? That is true because hatred and fear drive so much of our society. The people that do not understand us, cannot understand us, will not understand us, are so trapped by the misogynist notion that might equals right, and in order for things to be rectified, they must strike out in hatred and violence. And I wanna tell you as a man of God, a man who has chosen Christianity as my path, there is no God in that. <clears throat> there is no God in that. I don't care what Levitican law you dredge up, there is no God in that violence. The path of the righteous is paved with love and service. Love and service, love and service. And at that point, at this point, I wanna thank Tristan and all who aided Tristan in making this a reality when it was a lost cause. When no one wanted to stand up and someone decided to. So I'm working in Philadelphia. I'm working at the Morris home named after Niza Morris who was a uh, slain leader in the Philadelphia trans community. It is the first and only residential recovery program specifically for trans and gender variant people on the planet. The first and only, ever. And right now we have eight women in there who are attempting to recreate a life that has been filled with sorrow, disappointment, danger, criminality, addiction and suicide on the installment plan. Each and every one of them has been there and has stayed there and has worked diligently to become the woman that they've always wanted to be and I am so honored to play a part in their becoming. Nationally, in the last month, for the first time ever, 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 the Black Congressional Caucus hosted a panel of black trans women to speak on the Hill. First time ever. Woo! Yeah! While many of us choose to blend, and, and I have nothing against people's individual right of disclosure, some of us who stand in the gap between the seen and the unseen are coming out prouder and stronger every year. More of us are entering seminary. More of us are entering elections, more of us are coming out in our places of business, more of us are coming out in our families, and we are still here standing strong, although we lose far too many to violence every year. Every year we also gain new people to speak up for us, to stand with us as allies and as family, and I want to take this moment to thank all of the partners, the children, and the parents that do not disavow us when we transition. 
We could not be here without you. I'm going to be preaching tomorrow at South Congregational Church in Springfield. Come on by if you want to. And you know, one of the interesting things about being the person that I am is that everything that I am was not meant to be. I'm a black man who's not in custody and not on drugs. I'm a black man that was born with a vagina. I am a black man that was supposed to be cracked up and in a gutter somewhere who is nearing 29 years of sobriety. Everything I am and everything I have become is because of grace. We are here because of grace, the universe of grace. Part of why we are here standing here is because someone came before us, many someones came before us, they blazed a trail and many of them died in the act of blazing this trail. And so my job and my challenge to you is to not stand in your little private corner celebrating your transition, but to step out on faith and grace and blaze a trail for those coming after you. There is a little trans person being born tonight that needs your leadership today. Without your leadership today, they will surely die by their own hand or be killed. Because for many of us, those are the only options we have. I'm going to give you one final analogy and then I'm going to shut up. You don't have to. <laughs> oh, I'm tired of hearing myself sometimes. <laughs> um, in the black community, we spend hundreds of years in hiding and in servitude, hiding our languages, hiding our spirituality, hiding our true names, hiding our relationships, hiding our strength, hiding our wisdom, hiding our ability to read, and then several things happened. Through an act of political will that had less to do with our lives and more to do with capitalism, President Lincoln emancipated us. And yet some of us, though emancipated, could never be free until we freed ourselves, until we freed our minds. Many, 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 many years later, even after emancipation, Many activists, mostly in the Christian church, many Muslim and, and children of Islam activists, and some who were non-religious altogether, put up fights everywhere, all over the place, for our freedom. And yet, and yet, today, we still have racism alive and well. Why do I say that to you? Because our movement is not an instant oatmeal movement. We have to learn some patience. This movement is really very young. And while we want everything right now, <clears throat> everything worth having is worth work, working for. And the strength that we get from the work, the muscles that we build through the trials and tribulations are the things that make us stronger. So I ask you to not give up. To use the African American Civil Rights Movement as a, as a model and recognize that Jim Crow for trans people is still alive. But Jim Crow will die. Jim Crow has a very short life expectancy. There are still people fighting our president because they don't think that he deserves to be president. After all, in some places, he's still not yet a man. I identify with that story because in some places, I am still not yet a man. I stand with my president, and I stand with all men, and I challenge all of us as men to flip the script on the abuse that women suffer and to call out those among us that are rapists, that are murderers, that commit assault and to not let them hide in our male enclaves. It is up to us to stop rape and violence against women. It is not up to women to stop that tragic pandemic thing that is worldwide. So as a man that is able to blend easily, I am going into barber shops and pulpits and going where guys hang out and talk real talk and saying to them, if you are hiding a rapist, then you are not a man. And you are surely not a man of God. In this moment, while we talk about freedom for trans people, we cannot talk about freedom for trans people without talking about sexism, misogyny, racism, classism, nationalism, ableism. We all have that in our community. And part of why it's hard for us to build a trans community is because we will not work on our isms. Let's go first. Let's not recreate the mistakes of the lesbian and gay movement and pretend like we don't have differences that are valuable and that we don't have bigotry that must be overcome for us to come together. 
They've shown us for 30 years how to do it wrong. Let us show them how to do it right. I ask if you would just join me in a moment of prayer, because it's what I do. If you are not a praying person, join me in a spirit of light and of openness. Please. Universal spirit of many names and many experiences, we ask you here and now to hold our people. To hold the people that are not able to be here today. To hold the people that are not willing to be here today. To hold our enemies in your bosom. Teach us to love ourselves. To put down the things that keep us from being as self-loving as we can be. Heal our families. Heal our churches. Heal our neighborhoods. Help us to grow into the people you have designed us to be. Remind us that throughout history, those of us at the intersection of gender have always been the healers of community. They have stolen that history from us. Give us the will to reclaim it. Step in the gaps where harm would come our way. We ask you to hold our sister Vicki in your mercy and in your healing in this moment and wrap up Sammy and pull her to your bosom where she belongs. God, if you are among us, be within us, be beside us, be in front of us, fight our battles. And in this moment, we ask just for one day, just for this day, let no harm come to those of us that are walking in treacherous waters out of survival needs. We thank you for the gift of your grace and your mercy. And we ask you to reinforce us, refill us, refresh us, give us every resource that we need to fight this battle. We give you all praise and all thanks. In the name of all that is holy and all that is love, amen. I have the opportunity to introduce someone very special. And I have been given the permission to say whatever I want. You know, in every community, there are those folks that stand out, not because they're extraordinarily tall and beautiful, <laughs> but because their light and their energy is so overwhelming that it cannot be denied. Lorelei is one of those people. Not only are her accomplishments too many for me to name, but as importantly, more importantly, when people are feeling alone in our community, which is common, and when people are feeling like no one can stand with them, with might and with strength, and with passion and with humor, Lorelai is often the one who is standing there beside them saying, honey, just come with me, I'll get you up there. Honey, you can sit with me, it'll be okay. Nope, that looks just fine, let's walk. Come on, <laughs> let's go, sweetie, it'll be all right. Without someone like Lorelai, many in our community would have given up. And so while she is talented in many ways, the thing that I want to recognize in her is what a lifesaver you are. Yes. You may never know how many lives have been saved by just your smile, your strength, and your presence. And so on behalf of our entire community, I thank you, and I give you Lorelai. Wow, thank you. And everybody, show some love to Reverend Mitchell. Come on, make yeah. it loud. It was. Thank you, thank you. And uh, wow, that's wonderful to hear. The only thing I, I have to disagree is that my 70s feminist mother would smack me if I called anyone honey. <laughs> um, but thank you. And, and thanks, Reverend Mitchell, for breaking the seal um, on the size of this crowd. Because what we have right here is some very dedicated people who have shown up to support a community event. But I do know that there are a lot more people out there. There's a lot of us. There are so many of us who are afraid to walk out into the sunshine, who are afraid to stand up and be themselves and be proud of who they are. To be seen, even in a place like Northampton, there are too many of us who are afraid. And I know you're watching, 
and I know you're listening. So as Reverend Mitchell said, no, I'm standing with you. Anytime you're ready to go out, when you're ready to stand up and be seen and be counted and tell the world, yes, I am proud to be trans, Lorelei will be there with you. Now, thank you. I have a number of things to say, and uh, I've learned from hard experience in these sort of gatherings uh, that any time I ever have anything prepared, I end up having to throw it completely out the window. Uh, because I, I, I show up and, uh, well, the very first time I spoke in Northampton, I spoke at a, an anti-California Proposition 8 rally. And I came and I stood on these steps right here. I had just moved to Northampton from California and I had been uh, just a couple months previously at uh, a gala star-studded event in Beverly Hills celebrating the passage of same-sex marriage in California. And as soon as I moved out here, they started trying to pass California Proposition 8 to ban same-sex marriage. And I had some things to say about that. Okay. So, I came out here, and I said, can I please get up on your stage and speak? And I spent weeks and hours preparing this very meticulous speech. I studied the tradition of marriage. I studied the institution of marriage. I had intelligent and persuasive things to say about it. I, I had a whole section dedicated to how the, the idea of traditional marriage is bullpucky. Um, you know, for instance, you don't own your wife anymore. But then I got up on these steps and looked out at this crowd of Northamptonites and I said to myself, well, there's not a soul in this crowd I'm going to have to convince. <laughs> so I forgot everything I was going to say, dropped it all, and thank God I'm an improviser. And I stood here and I tried to give that crowd what it really needed, which was energy and drive and a reason to stand up and convince those people to go to those people in their communities who disagree with us, who fight us, and convince them that they're wrong. Because that's what I saw that our community needed. And what I'd like to tell you that we need is unity. L-G-B-T-Q-I-K-A-N-G-Q, unity. And transgender solidarity. Now here in Northampton, we have a long and storied history uh, of, of the gay liberation movement. It, when I lived here in the early 90s, I remember People Magazine was here and put us on their cover as uh, Lesbianville, USA. We have the highest amount of lesbians of any city in the US, which is a wonderful thing, wonderful people. They've been great to me. Um, but it wasn't always so. Trans people have not always been accepted, and we are not necessarily always accepted now. We're often left as the little t in the LGBT. And that cannot be. We cannot be the little t. We have to be the big t. We have to be able to lead ourselves. And now I look out and I see so much squabbling and fighting and I want to bang people's heads together and I want to tell them, do you remember what you were taught in kindergarten? How you don't have to like the other kids to get along with them? Sometimes we have to act like adults. We have to remember to work with people we don't necessarily agree with or understand because we have something bigger to do. Now, a lot of people ask me, what does trans have to do with, with the, the like LG and B stuff? It's not a sexuality, and that's true. It's, you know, it, it's accepted trans community gospel that gender and sexuality are totally different things. And there are a lot of people who need to hear that and be made to understand that. But the crowd I'm talking to right now is, I think, a crowd that's already got that 
understood it, wrote the book on it, got their master's degree in it. So, lots of people, I mean, I'm an advice columnist. It's supposed to be my job to give black and white answers, but I'm not any good at that because when I look at the world, I see a gray world. I see a world that consists of shades of gray. There are no black and white answers, and I'm sorry to break it to you folks. There are degrees of answers. We don't live in a world where gender and sexuality are in a vacuum. It's impossible to go through what you have to go through to be transgender, any version of transgender under the transgender umbrella and not intersect with all kinds of crazy aspects of sexuality and gender. I, for myself, as an example, because I, 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 I really, I can't talk about anyone else, but I can talk about my own experience. And my own experience is that I went from spending a lifetime pretending to be, for all intents and purposes, a heterosexual male. Now, I was theoretically bisexual, by which I mean I, you know, I, I, I could look at a man and say, yes, that is an attractive man with whom I would consider having sex. But generally speaking, that's not really how it rolled. I tended to date women. Then I got on hormones. I started HRT, and I entered a second puberty. And everything went haywire. And it went from sort of a theoretical sort of thing to, oh my lord, I would like to spend the evening with that gentleman right there. <laughs> but I was still in a long-term relationship with a woman, and I still like women. And then in the work I do, I meet all of these incredibly beautiful transgender and genderqueer people, and, and I had to just kind of throw it out the window. Now the reason I've given you that example is to say that as a trans woman, I've had to pass through sort of de facto being gay, being lesbian, being bisexual, being queer being all of these things, every part of the LGBTQAKANGQ, I have had to go through. And, you know, segments of that I've enjoyed more than others. I bet. But folks, we need to stand together. That's why we belong with the LGBTQ, etc. rainbow. That's why we belong in the alphabet soup. But, as transgender people, as I said, we need to stand strong and we need to stand together. Now I see far too many of my trans brothers and sisters and others fighting each other and knocking each other down. I, I see so much bickering and infighting and, and people arguing about who belongs and who doesn't, who's trans enough. And it's ridiculous to me. We have so much fighting we have to do. Now this is Massachusetts. And this is a pretty liberal place here. Things are not good, but they're a lot better here than they are a lot of other places in this country and especially in the world. But even here, we only just got our basic civil rights as transgender people in the past year. In the past six months, did I get transgender? Did I get civil rights? Did I get the basic right to employment and to housing? And even that's not complete. So we live in a state where same-sex marriage is already legal. Anyone can marry anyone else that they love. And yet, we had to wait for our basic civil rights. And we got there, we got some of them. But one of the reasons we're here today and one of the reasons it's important for us to keep coming together, to have events like this, 
Why do we have a trans pride in Northampton? It's a fine question. We got a bunch of civil rights. Why should we not stay home and watch Saturday morning cartoons? I know, I'm a big fan of Top Cat. And I totally just dated myself. <laughs> but really, I'll tell you why. Because there's work to do. Because we have some transgender civil rights here in Massachusetts. Thank you. But there's a lot of people in this country who don't have any. And here in Massachusetts, there's still some fighting to do. Yeah. We have to win public accommodations. Can any of you believe that we still don't have public accommodations? No. Now I understand, politically speaking, why things went the way they did. If you ask anybody who's ever participated in the civil rights movement, they will tell you that nobody gets their rights overnight. It's just not how it works. You know? Ask a, ask a woman if she'd give up the vote to wait for equal pay. It's just not how it works in politics. So we got a bunch of civil rights. But I can still be kicked off a bus, asked to leave a restaurant. I can be denied all sorts of services. I can be arrested for using the restroom. It's ridiculous, and it should not be. And the only way it will not be is if we, as a community, as transgender people first, and then as LGBTQ, A, I, K, A, and G, Q people, yes, come together and work together with trans people leading the fight, because we can't ask anyone to lead the fight for our own rights. We have to lead ourselves and bring our allies along. The only way we're going to get those rights is to come together to fight, to stand out, say, I'm proud to be trans. I will be counted. I am a human being and I deserve basic human rights. So my message to you out there and to the rest of you here. But you out there watching alone in your room, afraid to come out. If you're in a community where it's not safe, by all means, take care of yourself first. But if you are somewhere where it's going to be relatively safe, where you're not going to get beaten up for coming out. Now I know it's not safe anywhere psychologically for us to come out. The abuse that we take just standing out in the street is horrible. But unless we start standing out and saying, I'm trans, people aren't gonna see us, we're not gonna get those rights. So I beg you, come out. Be yourselves, do what it takes to make yourself happy. And then help us get the rights we deserve. Thank you everyone for coming today yeah. and for showing up. Woo. I love you all. Slancha. And I love you too. I love you. So, we're going to move on right now, and our next speaker to the stage is someone who is very dear to me. He's one of the first people I met in this community, and he uh, has been incredibly supportive of me personally. Um, and he made this happen today, honestly speaking. Now, I know a lot of us came together to make this happen, but... I wouldn't be standing here with a mic talking to you folks if it weren't for this man. So please, I want you to put your hands together for an incredible activist and a wonderful man, Tristan Dean. Lies, mostly lies, but thank you, Lorelai. Um, Oh, gosh. Okay, well, this is the smallest Pride event I've ever helped organize, but probably the most important. 
And I think that's what we need to remember. And don't feel discouraged because we only see some warm bodies in front of us because we have a video camera and this is going to be going out on the internet and it's going to be seen by thousands, maybe even a million people. So don't feel discouraged. And to my beloved partner Arjuna, it's not Schenectady. <laughs> Play your heart out because millions of people are going to hear your music. I've got the hardest acts in the world to follow because I programmed national trans speakers to speak first, and I am not that. I am an organizer. I rarely speak. But I'm really hoping this is my last speech for a while, so I decided I would try it. And I want to go back in history because I have been a part of Northampton for decades. Um, I'm wearing a t-shirt from a march that I attended in 1993. I was still out as a butch lesbian, but I knew I was trans and almost had the courage to say it out loud. 1993, this march did not include the T, um, so I'm going to show it to you. This is the T. I'm the T. T-Rex, and I'm bigger. Um, and so are all of us. In 1993, we didn't have it on the federal level yet. GLB was still fighting over B. Um, T, we were the people no one wanted to talk about, whether we were transsexual or transgender, drag queens, bush lesbians, or simply gender variant and straight, or whatever. We were not what GLB wanted to talk about out loud in Washington that year. Um, but in that year, that same year in 1993, here in Northampton, because Northampton has traditionally led the fight for every right and just cause, we added trans to the Pride March. We were the first in the nation to do so. I think Oregon did it a few months later. Um, and we were the first LGBT Pride March in the entire nation. And we did that because Leslie Feinberg came and asked us to. Leslie Feinberg defines as transgender, also defines as a trans man, but Leslie Feinberg is very clear that I am not a transsexual, I am transgender. Leslie Feinberg is as much a part of the trans community as someone on HRT seeking surgery like myself. Leslie Feinberg is an equal part of our community regardless of the number of surgeries she has or the, he has or the hundreds of thousands of dollars any of us spend. And that's my message. We are one trans community. We are trans, we are transgender, we are whatever label we call ourselves. But if we are gender variant in any way, we are part of this movement. We are part of this movement. And gender variance is something that we all, I think all of us experience at some point. I mean, it's, it, it is a spectrum, you know, whether you're a femme little boy or a butch little girl or anything in between at any point in your life. The freedom to be yourself and have self-expression is a part of American democracy, and that's really what this is about. I wanted to begin this speech and be cute and funny and snarky and pull a quote from a movie and tell you that I see dead people. Because actually I do. Um, I decided to do this and bring this event about after deciding to give it up earlier because I'm tired of this. I'm tired of the bickering in the trans community. I'm really tired of it. Um, because my best friend just died last month. Um, my best friend in activism from my college days at UMass Amherst, Jason McDonald. Uh, is a very courageous, young, gay activist who fought for trans rights and told us to include them before anybody in the student community there understood that it was important. And he said it before Leslie Feinberg showed up. And during that time, we were fighting the young Republicans. We were standing up to the bully of all time, Guy Glotus, who's now the Worcester County Sheriff, or was. I don't know if he won re-election or not. I hope he didn't. Um, but in the middle of that fight, um, Jason was outed to his conservative Catholic family. And his support for college was withdrawn. He was disowned. He became homeless. He never finished his college degree. And he barely survived. Um, he drifted from relationship to relationship, one roof to another, menial job after menial job, and he held on. And we stayed in contact, and I got phone calls, and I got emails, and at one point three winters ago, after I was divorced, and at the end of my rope, 
we found ourselves talking on the computer, both in houses without heat, in the middle of a very cold winter, wondering if we were going to make it through that year, and we both knew that we would. I'm one of the last people to talk to Jason um, before he died. Not Probably not the last, but one of the last. He sent me several emails. One was that he had just met a new lover, and that they had gone on their first date, and that after walking him home, Jason's lover never made it home to his home, and that they didn't know what had happened to him, and they couldn't find him. And then the last email I got, he told me things were dire, and that he was feeling really down, and I was busy that night, and I was tired, and all I said back was, you need to keep talking about this, talk on Facebook. And that was the last thing I heard until I heard that he was gone. So I decided, because this really shook me up, because it was 1990 when Jason lost his place at UMass because of homophobia. But I decided that his death shook me so hard and I remembered so much of that passion and that youth, youthful zeal that we all had and the vision we had and the vision that Jason had for a world that included GLBT and more because Jason also fought for social justice causes that included women and included the poor, that his work wasn't done and neither was mine, and that I couldn't let my own petty and selfish anger at my immature and nascent community, let's be honest, keep me from doing the work that I've done for so many years. So I brought this back, um, and I'm happily at the end of this this event, going to hand the reins over to Nikki Vanderhoff, who is a kick-ass trans woman. She's a retired Marine, and if anyone can bring this nascent, nascent community together and have the strength to bring us forward, it will be Nikki. Yay. So thank you, Nikki, for taking it. Thank you. But I also wanted to talk about Sammy Cornell, and better speakers than I have already honored Sammy. <coughs> Sammy and Vicky are my friends. Um, Sammy gave the keynote speech last year at the Trans Civil Rights Rally at First Baptist Church, and she represented the organizing board with her speech. And we wanted her to talk about what it means to stand up for the trans community and what you have to do. Because Sammy and Vicki were at every trans event I ever attended in a three-state New England area, and they were often homeless, they often had a car that was held together with band-aids, they usually were nearly or out of gas money and had to beg 10 bucks, but they always showed up. And that's what Sammy told the crowd last year. She said, you don't have to be a good speaker, you don't have to be brilliant, you don't have to have a college degree, you just have to show up. And that's what Sammy did. And I didn't realize Sammy was on her deathbed when I emailed her a few days ago and asked her to come to this, this event. I was hoping she would be our surprise speaker. And I had reserved a slot and not said anything to anyone for her. And somehow, I know that Sammy is here today, so I can feel her. Sammy, thank you. So, I wanted to also talk to you about more of the dead people that I see. I'm 48, I just turned 48. A lot, of, a lot of heroes have shaped me and shaped my thoughts and my decisions and my own activism. I'm from the Midwest. I can't help but think about Brandon Tina. I can't help but think about Matt Shepard. As well as people like Sylvia Rivera, Louis Sullivan, and so many names, new names that we read every year at our community TDR. I can't help but think of the AIDS quilt and thousands and thousands of names, including trans, gay, brothers, like Louis Sullivan. Lorelai is right, there is an intersection between G, L, B, and T. We are not in separate bubbles. Gender variance affects all of us, including heterosexual straight whites, heterosexual straight blacks, heterosexual, heterosexual straight everybody with privilege. Gender variance is part of personal expression, it's part of being free. It's part of what America is founded on, and that's really what we're fighting for. And if you can't find any other reason to be an ally than that, do it for yourself and the right of your, you and your children to express their differences, including within the realm of gender. 
So, like Lorelei, I had one speech, but I can't just throw it in a row. I want to thank everybody who did show up. I want to thank my loving partner, Arjuna, for handling sound. I hope you enjoy your music. And I want to leave you one more time with Sammy Carnell's message. Just show up. Even if it's just on Facebook. Thank you, Tristan. Give him some more love, everyone. Yes. Because that's what this is about. This is about love. Love and community. And so, with that only slightly awkward segue, I'd, uh, I'd like to bring to the stage right now one of the greatest allies I've known in this community. She's an amazing woman. She's a great musician. She, uh... She does a cover of this old Irish standard that I'm a huge fan of. I'd like you to put your hands together and show a whole lot of community love for the very amazing Arjuna Christ. Thank you, Lorelai. I want to start, first of all, with a um, little pie chart I made to help people understand about public accommodations. It says, uh, what happens when a trans person uses a public restroom, you know, the public restroom that most uh, closely corresponds with their gender identity. And I have several uh, sections of this pie chart. The blue is the, the sky falls. The red is no one thinks of the children. The green is anyone besides the trans person is endangered. And the uh, brown is the person who needs to go gets to go. So here is the very complex pie chart right here. So I'll, I'll start with, um, why not, start with that old Irish ballad <laughs> for Lorelai. <Aww>, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Oh, tranny boy, the dikes, the dikes are calling, and men for men, and pansexual guys. Rules dumb are gone, and trans women are vying for you, for you, the favorite of the by. So come ye back and play amongst the meadows. This happy valley is full of friends. Not foes. It's I'll be queer for those who buck the status quo. Oh, tranny boy, oh, tranny boy, I love you so. Someone can hold the mic for me. I I bought a mic stand yesterday for this and then left it in the other car.
could have been my friend Could have been anyone to die for some reason If last rites your only run in this bitter frozen land Didn't even know you but I, I know your silence well You took my love away from me She joined him in a quiet hell He took your life, did he take your pride? He's the demon Curling up inside the hearts of those who speechless lie in dark and dirty cells. And I find it hard that you were named for a man who wrote about the birth of one who lived a life of protest, crying out for peace on earth, who when tempted by the devil said a thing profoundly odd that we shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth. Out of the mouth of God And now I don't believe the stories From this book so old It starts to reek That God is in us Every time we bring ourselves to speak I didn't even know you So I'm feeling pangs are somehow wrong To barter dice you Analyzing this The stranger's eulogy I'm not blessed with sight divine The only story I really know is mine Each word is a small step In my journey to be free For as I'm singing out this breath Hot syllables to challenge death It may not warm your tortured skin Like a miracle come much too late But maybe I can chip away At this ice age of angry pain Place my fear with the burning joy and weld a molten love out of my head. I didn't even know you, but you could have been my brother, you could have been my lover, you could have been my friend. You are one in too many who have died apart from reason. Last rites, you're only right in this bitter frozen land. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is a song I wrote for a woman named Grace. She's sort of an amalgamation of a bunch of amazing trans women I know, including Lorelai, actually. <laughs> She's in here, a little bit. Right. <clears throat> well, she goes walking in the morning Dressed from heart to heel in gray for the city blending with the buildings to make it through her day but when the sun goes down she blooms an evening primrose iridescent pink beneath the glare of the spotlight to her it's just the moon rising none too soon and she surrenders her fragrance to the night She sings torch songs, maybe does a little cabaret. The late crowd gets a serenade of all familiar tones. Each one of them a secret lullaby. But to a girl who dipped in blue. He tried to toss her to the roadside. Crushed her petals and stripped her tiny stem. He did not know poor soil is where she thrives. And railroad embankments and chain link lots come down. She lands on bare ground, sinks her roots down, and makes the wasteland blossom in the twilight. All she wanted was 
girls to go to the dance To be true, to be welcomed, to be seen more for you. <coughs> One is a, uh, a poem that I was asked to read. It's my little manifesto that I uh, wrote many years ago, but it still holds true. Normal is hatred, and normal is greed. Normal is living beyond our means. Normal is the church, and normal is the steeple. Normal is profits over people. Normal is straight and male and white, getting pulled over if you don't look right. Normal is peacefully processing silence till the cops come over and incite violence. Normal is bombing abortion clinics, saving the tissue and killing the doctor. Normal is screaming at a woman walking in, preaching damnation because somebody knocked her up, never knowing that her heart is torn, never giving a goddamn thing to the kids already born. Normal is a redwood forest seen in terms of paper. Normal is a child's laughter turning into vapor as she sews in a factory for like nine cents a day. And somebody buys a t-shirt and thinks, ah, 60 isn't much to pay. Not for Gap Guest Tommy Nike Swish. Anyway, normal is animals who never feel the ground, fed their tubes in cages much too small to even turn around, bred to feed a constant need for over-consumption. Normal is apathy, arrogance, and assumption. Normal is band-aids instead of prevention, birth lying down because of doctor's pretension. Normal is not questioning the status quo. Normal is just the way it goes. Normal is more money for prisons than schools. Normal is using the master's tools, the line between church and state crumbling like sod. Normal is a pledge to this one nation under God. Normal is like 1050 for a movie with no plot. <laughs> Just advertising, pretty stars, not so special effects. Normal is incinerators, poisoning the have-nots. Normal is laws against having oral sex. Normal is a euphemism coming down the wire, collateral damage, ethnic cleansing, friendly fire, till we hardly even realize that war means people die. And nobody ever wins. Maybe grief and madness tie normal's testing lipstick on a rabbit's open eye. Corporations telling their news media to lie. Normal's rape your wife, she has to honor and obey. Normal's being judged by how much you friggin' weigh. Normal is toxic waste and cigarettes. Normal is not cleaning up our mess. Normal is lies and hypocrisy. Normal is girls getting screwed but not wet. Normal is being controlled by fear. Us versus them and you versus me, and I'd like to say that I've seen normal. And honey, I'd rather be queer. <laughs> I'd like to leave you with one I wrote last year for the Trans Day Remembrance, which is coming up in November. And um, if you feel like singing along, I'll do it twice. It's a fairly easy melody. Um, so if you feel like singing Jay. along, uh, please feel free. Jay. And um, <laughs> uh, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who's here, everyone who's spoken, and uh, everyone who's uh, working with us to, um, uh, to make life better for, for all of us out in the community, queer, trans, the quilt bag community, as I like to say. Makes it a little easier, quilt bag. Uh, <laughs> And we need public accommodations now. It's ridiculous that we don't have them, that uh, people are, are so caught up in fear uh, that they don't let people have just basic rights 
to live their lives freely. All right, so this is called No More Names. We speak your names with wounded tongues, friends and beloveds cut down to young. We hold your names cradled in our hands. They give us calls to take a stand year after year. The list grows too long. We honor you with voice. We honor you with song. We will fight for justice for each name we call until the day when there are no. Regina Christ, friends, <laughs> let her feel love. This next speaker is uh, a pretty inspiring woman. She's brave, and I am incredibly happy to have her here. She's a, a prostatist. <laughs> <laughs> Please, everybody, put your hands together for Kelly Hoover. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Kelly Hoover. Um, and like Lewis had expressed, I grew up very different than I present to you as I am today. I grew up here in New England. Um, I grew up as Jonathan Robert Huber. And as of a year ago, I was still Jonathan Robert Huber. Um, I'm proud to say that now I am Kelly Noel Huber. Um, this past year has been an amazing trip for me. Um, my transition has gone, in many eyes, and in, certainly in my own eyes, has gone extremely smoothly. And after listening to Lewis speak, and him speaking about people who have gone before me and gone before all of us, 
it's clear that some people have paved quite a good path for us. Um, for myself, um, initially I was fired from my job in Connecticut as a prosthetist. And I will explain what a prosthetist is since everyone's eyes were probably slightly confused when that was said. Um, I am a person who makes artificial limbs. I make artificial limbs for amputees who have lost their legs, lost their arms, um, whether it's from war, whether it's from diabetes, whether it's from sickness, that's my job. Having that viewpoint and understanding what the rehab process is about is something that was very dear to me when I was about to tackle my own inner concerns. And that was that I, my body, as people would say, didn't necessarily match my mind. When I was going about moving forward to become myself, I realized seeing a lot of my patients go through the process of losing their limb and coming to terms with losing their limb, there's a change that happens in the person when they recognize they're different or things aren't going to be the same. They, they lose something that's special in them. They don't behave or act like the person they are. They lose the person they are for a period of time. And I can say for myself, over this past year, and even more, probably three years, the person that I was disappeared for a while because all I was thinking about was, was my gender correct? Could I walk into a bathroom? Could I walk into my workplace? If I came out at my workplace, would I be fired? Would my children lose their home because I came out as a trans person? And that came very close to happening. After coming out at my work in Connecticut, three months later, I was fired. I lost my job. I was put into a position of having to find another job. Luckily, I had found a place that I had worked at for seven years prior to that, and I was immediately accepted and was able to come back. And when I returned, it wasn't long after that, and that, that job is here in Massachusetts. I work at Braintree Rehab Hospital in Braintree, Massachusetts. And when I came out there, the law here in, in the state of Massachusetts had yet to be passed. So when I stepped forward again, the fear of knowing that I could simply be fired once again was very real and very true. Luckily, that process has gone seamless. I am absolutely amazed that I can walk down a hospital full of 300 employees and have yet to have a negative comment brought towards me. I have come out to all my patients. And when I speak about my patients, these are not patients that I see once or twice and then they're gone. These are patients I see for a lifetime. And I have absolutely been accepted. The words I get from people is, are you still going to be here? Are you still going to do what you do? Are you still going to be my prosthetist? Are you still going to make it? Essentially what they're saying to me is, are you still going to make a difference in my life? And the message that I want to bring to you today is that I know that public accommodations is a huge concern here in the state of Massachusetts. And passing laws about this is extremely important. But as Lewis had said earlier on, it's us as people that make that change happen. And when I approached my transition, I made a vow to myself. I said every single person in my life, whether it's the patients I see, whether it's my parents, whether it's my children, whether it's my ex-wife, whoever it was, I was going to sit down with each and every one of them and explain to me them the sincerity of who I am and the sincerity of who I am not just as a woman, but as a person, as a caring person who makes a difference in this world. And I think that what each of us should be doing is that, as much as it's wonderful that a laws the past, getting out there, being yourself, explaining who you are, explaining the sincerity of who you are, is the most important part of this. And I ask each and every one of you who are trans to take that step. Not an easy step. Trust me, every single person that I stood before, the way I describe it, it was like jumping off a cliff. When you jump off a cliff into a deep pool of water, you don't know if you're coming up when you reach that water. And every time I jumped off that cliff, this cliff, the same fear rose inside me. But wonderfully, 
I have yet to have a, say, have a person say to me they don't want me in their life. So, what I say to you is if you're in that position, take that step, but don't stop taking that step. Because my transition has gone smoothly, I don't have any difficulty when I walk into 7-Eleven and someone suspecting that I might have been male at one time. I didn't expect that. I had a fear that I would be walking everywhere and everyone would think, oh my gosh, there's a guy in a dress. <clears throat> I could do that. I could move on. I could just simply be a woman. But I choose to express to people who I am as a whole person. And the value in that is that in the future, there will be people, there will be children, there will be people who are in their 60s, who when they decide to come out, decide to be who they are, it's just a simple no-brainer. Okay, this person needs health care, this person needs to be better, this person can be happy. And it's not as big of a concern. And I hope, as we all move forward, that that's what the world looks like in several years. That people can just be themselves and be accepted for who they are and given the right medical attention to do that. And I want to thank you all for coming out today. And thank you so much. Um, this is, I know it's a small crowd, and normally I speak, speak to one person at a time. Um, and paradoxically, Tristan had said to me as we walked this, or started to come to this, that um, I had said to him, the way I like to do things is one person at a time. So it's quite strange that I'm standing up here in front of a group of people and expressing to more than one person at a time. But I want to thank you all for listening to me. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Everybody give her love. Well, we're coming towards the final uh, part of this Northampton Trans Pride event. But before we move on, um, a lot of you will have seen this sign uh, sitting on the steps, seen me holding it. And you will have seen this sign or signs like it on the internet, on your Facebook pages. Uh, if you're not familiar, Cece McDonald is a trans woman of color who has been put in a men's prison for defending herself. She was attacked. The victim of a hate crime. And she fought back using whatever means were at her disposal and injured her attackers, killed one of them accidentally. She's being charged with second degree manslaughter and held in prison for defending herself against a hate crime. This must not be. <clears throat> Cece McDonald is our sister. She is one of us. And as long as we are being attacked, as long as we are being killed, as long as we are unjustly imprisoned for defending ourselves from this very harsh world. We will never truly be free, any of us. So I ask you, I beg you, find information about C.C. McDonald. It's not hard to do. I'll give you a little secret. I'm an advice columnist. The way I write most of my columns is I fire up Google and I enter in the question. And then I go from there and say some <laughs> snarky things and enter information that I get off the internet. You can do that too. Find out about Cece. Help get her out of prison. Help get her out of this terrible circumstance. Support one of our transgender sisters. Free Cece McDonald now. Everybody with me. Free Cece. Free Cece. Free Cece. Raise your voices with me. Free Cece. Free Cece. Free Cece. Free Cece now. Thank you. And so, uh, at this point, I'd like to begin the community speak out segment of, of this uh, program today. 
and to start off the community speak out where we will, at least for a few minutes, welcome anyone who is uh, inspired to speak up to the mic to say a few words. And to start that off, I'd like to introduce a beautiful woman and a friend of mine, the person who will be taking over this event next year. Give a warm round of applause for Nikki Vanderhoff, everyone. Steam out. There you go. And one of the things I had said was last week when I said that I was going to stand up and speak, it seemed like a really good idea. Today arrived and the nerves were up and it didn't seem like really that great of an idea. Having listened to everybody who came before me, it is a good idea because this is what we need to do. We need to get out and be visible. <clears throat> I am here today to be counted. I'm an honorably discharged from the Marine Corps and a Desert Air veteran. When I enlisted, I took the same oath all the service women and men take in the U.S. Armed Forces. And that is to defend this country from all enemies, both foreign and, and domestic. Yes. Nope, I just find where I am. <laughs> that was a pretty good place to pause. Woo, yeah, Nikki! Okay. So I ask you, where are the protections for the trans community <clears throat> from our enemies who reside right here among us? Why are public accommodations not afforded to the trans community? Every time I go out, I have my children with me. Guys, raise your hands. <clears throat> These are three of my five children that are out to their first trans rally event. Every time I go out in public with my children, I have no defense should I be singled out and told to vacate the premises. Not asked to leave because I was stealing or causing a ruckus. But because of being who I am, who I've always been. There's a lot of push in these days to end bullying. We just had Spirit Day yesterday to stop putting an end to bullying. But yet, is it right for my children to have to witness their parent being bullied in a public setting? Why is it okay for people not to bully them, but it's okay for other segments of society to be bullied. <clears throat> Being African American is not a choice. Being gay is not a choice. And being trans is not a choice. Amen. <clears throat> Who would volunteer to be persecuted? <clears throat> I didn't take two hours to get ready today versus the 15 minutes it used to take me because this is a passing phase. Our civil rights should be afforded to everybody, not just those that label themselves mainstream society. I'm not asking for society to agree with who I am, but I am demanding that they respect me.
During the American Revolution, one of the battle cries was no taxation without representation. Well, I pay my taxes, so my next question is, where's my representation? I think it's time for another American Revolution fought right here in the Bay State. A revolution for equal rights for all. Yeah! Woo! Woo! They're Way called go, rights Senator for a reason. Off. They're intended for everybody. My children don't love and accept me because I'm trans. They love and accept me because of who I am. I am taking over this event for next year. I am looking for people to step up, join the steering committee, and come out. Um, if there's any questions, I'm on Facebook. You can talk to me afterwards. And with that, I bid you adieu. Oh my gods, that was wonderful. Uh, well, at this point, is there anyone out there who feels quaked to speak? We have a couple minutes left. You're totally welcome. I'll even stand next to you and hold your hand if you want. Anyone want to say anything? Going once? Going twice? Oh, we have a taker. Come on up. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jean. I am beginning my transition and I have been turned down by two surgeons in 36 hours. My surgery was scheduled for the 18th of this month and I got sick. So I canceled my surgery due to illness and the surgeon fired me right then and there as a client and has refused to operate on me. And I am getting ready to go in for my third consult this Thursday at 2.30 at Exeter Hospital in Exeter, New Hampshire. And I am hoping for a mastectomy um, because of my size. But I am hoping to have some type of top surgery soon. And I am new to this. I have been semi-talking to somebody on the internet that we met online. and. Uh, for about a year now, it'll be a year next year, and we're both transitioning. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Woo! Woo! Good luck, dude! Yeah! yeah. <clears throat> wow! Let him feel loved! Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow, that's inspiring <clears throat> to me. I love seeing people get up and stand up and shout it out loud. I am trans and I am here. We're not gonna hide anymore. We're not gonna stay in the closet. We're here. We're like some 50s horror movie. We're among you already. <laughs> yeah. So. I want to thank you all. Oh my God, yes! Come on up! Oh, we have more, and a wonderful good friend of mine. Here you go, Nick. Thank you, Lorelai. I'm gonna be honest, I did not plan on coming today. Back in 2008, when we first started Trans Pride, I was part of that initial organization. I was 20 years old. I first heard about it, um, from a friend of mine at college who was on some mailing list who was like, hey, this thing is starting. Let's go to a planning meeting. But we need to do self-care things and probably shouldn't get in as, as involved as we are. We do in things because then we'll burn out and, but we'll go and be there for support and do what we can while taking care of ourselves. I should know better than that about myself and ended up doing a whole number of things as I do when I'm 20 years old. So, and still now I'm 25. And it was awesome. It was the first Trans Pride march and rally that we had in Northampton. And I got to meet and work with some fantastic people. 
we had a huge turnout. People came from all over New England, from Philadelphia. Some like it was amazing. We marched through the streets. We had our rally. We had fantastic speakers. We flew people out from as far away as California to perform and speak. And it was one of the most exhilarating experiences of my life. I remember the first planning meeting I went to was in December. After going to that, I wrote letters to a couple family members and my mom's friends that I grew up with officially coming out, even though I had already been on hormones and changed my name and had surgery and all that, being like, hey, here I am. You all have been a part of my life forever and you mean a lot to me. Um, please don't hate me. Please call me Nick or Nicholas. Um, and use he, him pronouns because that's my preference. And I was a huge, while I was in college, I was a huge, act, huge activist and organizer and that year put together the first drag ball that we had and um, decided that we were gonna have a fundraiser to then donate to Trans Pride that year and a couple of the organizers came to my event and while I was there informed me that my grandmother had mailed a donation to support Trans Pride and she didn't even tell me and she was one of the people that I mailed a letter to and I had no idea and Andrew was like hey do you know uh, Heike Byram from Texas? I'm like that's my grandmother we got a check in the mail in the in the mail today from her and it donating money. I was like, and I hadn't slept in like two days, so that completely rejuvenated me for that night. And I remember the feeling that I had on Trans Pride on that incredibly hot 90 plus degree, very sunny day in June, where I almost got heat stroke, and a very good friend of mine stole me away from my responsibilities to so throw me to pool at a hotel so that I wouldn't pass out. I felt awesome. And then the fractioning started. <laughs> and community kind of fell apart and all this infighting that we've been talking about started happening. And I was like, hey, wait, wait, what are you doing? Wait, no, we got, can we, can we just talk about this? Can we just try to get on the same page and meet each other where we're at and keep this together? And things kind of fell apart, right? And you know, as queer folks in general, we all have that pain and hurt that we've experienced our whole lives. And sometimes we forget that our friends aren't the ones who hurt us first. And sometimes we take shit out on, I'm sorry, take stuff out on each other and do Jealous. really messed up things to each other when we really don't mean to. And we're coming from a place of hurt, but we're too blinded by it to see it. And I've, I'm one of those people who have kind of distanced myself because not only do I not want to have that directed at me, but it breaks my heart too much to see it. And I'm hoping that we can find each other again and that we can come back together and heal ourselves and hear each heal each other and work through what we've done and where we've been and keep moving forward in doing the things that we do. Because we gotta take care of each other, you know? It's gonna take a Marine! Go Marine! We gotta take care of ourselves. And we gotta take care of each other, because this is a community thing. And, you know, that trans enough thing is bullshit, and I've been saying that my entire life, because it is bullshit. Queer enough is bullshit. Like, all of it is bullshit. We all, like, we're all part of the same fabric, folks. Come on. Woo! So we all go about our personal journeys in different ways, but can't we walk together in the same general direction? Please? I might not understand where it is you're coming from, where you're going through, but I'll listen and try the best I can, and I hope that somebody would afford me the same. And I'll listen even if that's all I can do and I can't do anything else even though I want to. Because another important thing about self-care and community care is knowing our limits and taking care of ourselves when we need it and each other and stepping up for folks to do the things that they cannot do because we all have different abilities. We all have 
different needs and we all have different ways of meeting those needs. And I'm glad I came today. And I'm glad that I got to hear the amazing voices and hear the same Normal Is poem <laughs> that I first heard when I came to my first Northampton Pride when I was 14 years old and a little queer growing up and not knowing what was going on. To hear that again and be reminded of how excited I was when I was 14 and I finally found people who kind of got it and had my back and held space while I figured my crap out. And I'm still figuring it out, don't get me wrong. I mean, we all kind of are, right? So, can we be there for each other? Yeah. Is that a thing we can do, please? Yeah. Even when it's really hard. Even if that means just being there for ourselves first so that we can be there for other people. Thank you. All Thank you. you. Woo! Yeah. Thank you, Nick. And thank you for everything you did to start this off. And that's what... One minute. More time? Yeah. yeah. What's that? Yes. More time? Yes. Do we have more time? Yep. Yes. Yeah, oh, you. my Lord, yes! We have more. Come on up. Thank you so much. Please, the mic is yours. Hello. My name is Susanna, and I'm a junior at Mount Holyoke. And yeah! <laughs> my preferred gender pronouns are anything besides he. So, whatever you want. Um, I'm just here on behalf of a movement that we're starting in the Valley in response to the Amherst Fraternity T-shirt incident. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it. Tell us about it. Okay. So, this... You're on video. You're on Hi. video, by the way. Um, so... Last spring, um, an unofficial fraternity that is off campus but associated with Amherst created this shirt for its annual pig roast. And it had, I'm going to give a trigger warning for violence um, and battering and rape culture. Um, so it had an image of a woman on a spit roasting over a fire with a bra and a thong and bruises on her side and an apple in her mouth. Um, and then it said, Amherst College, colon, roasting fat once since 1847. And that was the shirt that they were selling in 2012. Um, and, and the really unfortunate thing is that this just became... This just became news about a week ago when a student wrote an article about it, but it happened in April. And so then there was a lot of energy generated in response to that article that was so terrible. Um, the, I mean, the article is brilliant, depicting the t-shirt that was terrible. And yesterday we actually had a rally in Amherst because the Board of Trustees was meeting to discuss the rape policy at Amherst College. And there were 10 students kind of elected by the Board of Trustees to go and represent the student body and we wanted to show our support for them and then also stay there and cry out that we wanted the board to talk to us as well, talk to everyone in the Valley. Uh, and there were people from all five colleges in the consortium and other colleges in the area and the surrounding area, just townsfolk. And it was awesome. I think there were about 150 people there at least, and it was pouring rain. Yeah. So on a day like this, job. who knows? I mean, there were 3,000 or more invited on Facebook. So, so we're going to generate a valley-wide movement to try to address rape culture and perpetuate a culture of consent instead. And it's going to be called tentatively um, the ARE, Alliance for the Respect of Every Body. And we want that movement to be inclusive of all genders, people of all genders. Woo! And so... Woo! Thank you! Yes! Yeah! Because we all are bodies, you know? Um, so I just want to say, hey, and that's going to happen. And we're hoping to create some prototypes that can be sent around the country to make this a national movement. Um, today, I'm finishing up a press release that we're sending to everywhere. So look for us in the news and talk to me. I'm down here. I can take your email if you want to be in the loop. And thank you again for having me. And thank you.
And that's what it's all about, folks. It's about unity and community. It's about coming together. Activism is about being activated, supporting each other. So if you're on the outside, come on in. If you're on the inside, time to keep working. If you were involved and you've stepped away, the fight's not over. We need you back. And if you're afraid to step out and join us, we will stand with you. But we need you to come join us and be our future. I want you to join me in a quick chant. Trans rights now! Trans rights now! Trans rights now! Trans rights now! Thank you. I love you all.